get started. Uh, first of all, sorry for the technical difficulties and that we're starting a few minutes late. Uh, I first want to say thank you all for coming. Um, I'm really excited to give this talk. This is the first time that I've had a chance to, to give this talk publicly. Um, so I'm excited to give it and I hope that you all find it useful. Um, so the title of this talk is Bridging Voter Data and Social Data Using Apache Streams. Uh, my name is Brian Hodge. I'm a data engineer at a company called Civitech. Um, and I want to start by talking just a little bit about my background. Uh, so my educational background is in computer science and linguistics. Uh, my professional background is working as an engineer and a data professional uh, with a number of big data technologies, uh, with, uh, with especially with a focus on Apache Spark. Um, I've also done a lot of work in relational databases, uh, especially in Postgres, um, and have done uh, lots of data engineering around various pieces of machine learning platforms, um, pipelines, model deployments, etc. Um, I'm a member of the Apache Streams PMC. Um, I'll be talking a lot about Apache Streams during this talk, as you might imagine, so you'll be hearing about that a little bit more later. Um, I'm currently employed as a data engineer at a company called Civitech. Uh, Civitech is a software company. Uh, we build tools for progressive political campaigns and causes. Um, and that's actually a, a very relevant bit of context um, because the system that I'm going to be describing during this talk um, and the situations that caused us to want to build that system um, were situations that arose uh, at Civitech during 2019 and 2020. Um, so some of that background will be will be highly relevant and will be featured during during this talk. All right. Um, so before I really dive into things, I want to start by giving um, kind of a roadmap of what to expect from this talk. Um, so this talk is about the application of Apache Streams mainly, uh, but also various other open source technologies to the particular problem of voter data enrichment in the political data space. So over the course of the next 30 to 35 minutes, I hope to do the following. Uh, first, I want to give some background and some context uh, around the motivations of this effort. Um, I know some of you in the chat work in political data, and so you'll know that there is uh, a lot of nuance and a lot of uh, detail embedded in the voter data ecosystem. Uh, I certainly can't download all of that in the next 30 minutes, but I will try to paint um, enough of a picture that you understand uh, the problems that we were facing, uh, the associated challenges, and how those drove um, requirements of our solution. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, the next thing that I'll do is give uh, an architectural overview of the system that we built. Um, uh, I'm less interested in uh, really nitty gritty um, uh, architectural details and implementation details, and more interested in uh, choice of tools, uh, the roles that we saw individual components playing, um, some challenges that we faced, and what we feel are uh, the next steps when it comes to a system like this. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'm hopeful that this talk can provide uh, kind of a case in point for the kinds of systems that Apache Streams is useful to build. Um, I think the particular problem that I'll be talking about uh, and the particular solution that we built is interesting and useful, um, but really I think it's a, a great showcase of uh, the sorts of work that Apache Streams can, can help out with um, and can substitute in for um, in the kinds of projects that we're all interested in building. All right, um, uh, one administrative note that I meant to, to say at the top, uh, if you have questions, please feel free to throw them in the Q&A section of the chat as I talk. Um, if I see one that seems particularly relevant to where I'm at, I might jump in and go ahead and answer it. Uh, but if nothing else, I plan to leave at least um, five minutes or so at the end to, to address questions. Great. All right, um, so let's start with some context. Uh, as I said, the title of this talk is Bridging Voter Data and Social Data Using Apache Streams. So what do we mean by voter data? Uh, when I talk about voter data here, I specifically mean uh, two broad categories of things. Uh, the first is voter contact information, uh, things like mailing addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, and social media handles. Uh, and then we also mean demographic information, uh, name information, uh, age and dates of birth, uh, various demographic descriptors like race, ethnicity, or gender identity, um, area of residence. Um, why are these things important? Uh, various organizations, um, uh, campaigns, activist organizations, organizers, uh, they care about these bits of information for a few reasons. Uh, first and foremost, they're interested in doing outreach. Uh, they're interested in 
uh, registering people to vote. They're interested in getting out the vote. Uh, they may be interested in gathering information from people that they feel are prospective voters uh, or trying to run influence campaigns where they try to uh, disseminate information about a particular cause. Uh, to do all of those things, they need to know who you are and how they can reach you. So that's the first reason why why voter data is crucial to those organizations. Uh, the second reason is that they're interested in doing research. Um, they want to know, uh, say, that a particular electoral district uh, used to be characterized by certain demographic descriptors, but is now characterized by a different set of demographic descriptors, um, or that um, uh, there's a, a high prevalence of people who have um, mailable addresses that have not had previous campaigns run against them in a particular area. So. Um, these bits of information are also useful for doing research about uh, like potential for, for future work. Uh, and then finally, they're useful for doing analysis of past work. Uh, if an organization runs a mailing campaign or a text campaign, they wanna be able to afterwards do retrospectives and say, uh, this campaign was particularly successful or unsuccessful with respect to targets that met certain qualities, um, either targets that they engaged in a certain way or targets that had certain uh, demographic or other features. Um, maybe their campaign was particularly successful with young people or with people that they were able to text rather than call on the phone, et cetera. Um, so uh, those are kind of a, a, a host of reasons why uh, these bits of information are very relevant to um, organizations and campaigns that are trying to use them. So um, in thinking about the importance of that data, um, we sat down to think about uh, the current state of affairs of the voter data ecosystem, uh, especially when it comes to the progressive voter data ecosystem. Um, so broadly speaking, the voter data that's available to campaigns, organizers, and activist organizations is, first of all, expensive. Um, the kind of state of the art of the data available in the, in the ecosystem is really a, a patchwork of data from different data sources, um, and obtaining that data is, is very expensive. And it's not just a one-time upfront cost, it's a recurring cost. Um, and that's one of the, the biggest costs that makes it so prohibitive uh, to run a campaign in, in the United States of any size. Um, in addition to being expensive, uh, voter data is often outdated. Um, maybe it's an address that you used when you registered for a car several years ago. Maybe it's an email address that you had when you were uh, a student or an employee at another organization. Uh, maybe it's a phone that you had when you were young and now you've swapped to a different phone. Uh, and finally, uh, voter data is also largely unreliable. Um, perhaps different bits of information in a record describing you uh, are not actually correct, like your date of birth is wrong. Uh, perhaps the record describing you has 10 phone numbers attached to it, and one of them is the right one, but we're not really sure which one. Uh, or perhaps uh, voter data sources will confuse uh, people who seem superficially similar, like people who have very similar last names, uh, but who are actually like a, a junior and a senior, perhaps. Um, and so uh, even if you could get your hands on it, and even if it was very up to date, you're not sure how much you can trust the information that voter data contains. Um, so broadly speaking, those are all quality problems with voter data. Uh, in addition to that, there are also, uh, like even, even if you felt very confident about the quality of this data, um, as I mentioned, the current state of the art is kind of a, a patchwork of different data sources, um, and those data sources lack uh, common and consistent unique identifiers. So even if you have a set of records that you feel very confident in um, and that you feel are, are useful and that you can run valuable campaigns with, it's hard to do useful things with them unless you can say that certain chunks of those records actually belong together and seem to describe the same person. Um, so the end result of these kind of two problems taken together is that organizations are forced to do targeting, campaigning, and outreach with data that is woefully insufficient for their purposes. Um, so that leads us to a problem statement uh, that's, as I'm sure you'll agree, a very uh, uh, large and ambitious problem statement, uh, which is that we need a way to do um, entity resolution across these many data sources. Uh, and we also need a way to enrich the data that is attached to those result entities uh, to increase the quality of that data. Uh, I, I hope you'll agree with me when I say that that's a hard problem. Um, and that's the conclusion that we arrived at when we started thinking about this as well. So our approach was to say, let's stop and take a step back. Let's think about what uh, an initial step 
uh, or an, an incremental approach to solving this problem might look like. Um, one thing that occurred to us is that social data is actually remarkably underrepresented in the data sets available in the political data ecosystem, uh, especially given uh, the importance of social media identities in our lives and in politics especially. Um, uh, politicians are very active on places like Twitter. Uh, various activist organizations run ads on social media networks all the time. Um, and places like Twitter are also uh, uh, sites where lots of political discussion and discourse happens. Uh, broadly speaking, social media identities are a, a big part of our lives um, and represent a big part of the footprint that we leave on the world. Uh, and yet that kind of data enrichment is, is largely missing from the voter data ecosystem. Um, in fact, from what we can tell, there are no uh, vendors or data sources in the ecosystem that offer voter data enrichment. Um, social data is a valuable enrichment to existing data sources. So uh, kind of talking through how social data as uh, data enrichment might resolve or help to resolve some of the problems outlined in the previous slide. Um, social data is, first of all, a valuable enrichment to existing data sources uh, for lots of reasons. Uh, it's another way of reaching someone. Uh, it opens avenues for different kinds of research and analysis based on the information that it gives you access to. Um, and crucially, it broadens the scope of who we're able to target. Um, traditional um, uh, voter access methods might rely on uh, data sets that really originate with people who have voted before or who have been registered to vote before, um, which leaves out a lot of like a, a really big portion of the American electorate, uh, especially lots of people that we as uh, progressive organizers and activists and professionals are interested in reaching. Are interested in reaching. Um, so social data also um, uh, broadens that aperture as well. Um, in addition to that, uh, social data identities are also uh, pretty valuable as unique identifiers. Uh, if you go to Twitter and go to twitter.com slash B underscore Hodge, there's only one of them and it's me. Um, so if I know that a certain person has a certain social media identity um, and I can feed that to other data providers and have them tell me things they know about that identity, that's a really nice way of having uh, kind of a, a unique identifier that we can build other facts around. Okay, so where we're at now is we've uh, identified the current state of affairs. Uh, we've got a problem statement resulting from that. And we think that maybe we have uh, kind of an initial inroads into a solution to that problem. Um, so now I wanna talk briefly about uh, how uh, that brought us to a set of goals for the system that we wanted to build. So we wanted to build a system that had the following properties. Uh, first, it needed to be able to enrich existing voter records in the ecosystem with online social profiles and also bits of related metadata that could be useful. Second, it needed to be able to take um, online social profiles of interest. Maybe these are people who have been uh, talking about topics that, that your campaign or organization is especially interested in, uh, or people who follow uh, people on Twitter or some other social media network that strongly indicates that maybe they would be a supporter of your cause. Um, or maybe there's someone who is engaged with an ad or with some other campaign that you've run. Uh, however we figure out what those interesting social profiles are, we need to be able to take them um, and resolve them into corresponding voter records that already exist in the ecosystem. Uh, we also need to be able to cache and reuse uh, data that is retrieved from various third-party and commercial data sources. Uh, and finally, we wanted to be able to characterize uh, the match rates, the accuracy, and also the overall efficacy and cost-benefit analysis of different third-party commercial data sources that we talked to. All right, so these were the goals that we had when we set out to build uh, a system to try to be an incremental approach to solving this problem. Um, uh, and now that we're here, I want to detour very briefly and talk about how um, Apache Streams, uh, actually, sorry, that's that's coming up in, in one more slide. Um, so I've talked a little bit about what the motivations for uh, this problem broadly are, um, like what, what the general problems were that led us to wanting to build this kind of solution. Um, now I want to talk a little bit more about the particular motivations around using social data as an enrichment. Um, so first, there's a built-in freshness to social data. Um, people tend to use social identities and hold on to them 
a lot longer than they might other kinds of identities or, or contact methods. Uh, there's built-in resilience to social media identities. Um, if you move, then you lose your mailing address. Uh, if an email inbox becomes too cluttered, you open a new one. If you lose your phone, you might get a new phone number. Uh, but uh, social media identities tend to be a lot more resilient than those things. You tend to hang on to them. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, social media identities have um, uh, built-in notions of accessibility. There are clearly defined channels of reaching someone who has a certain social media identity. Um, and moreover, those channels are things that we can build software around um, and we can build software tools to access programmatically. Um, another reason why social data enrichment is valuable is uh, due to the availability of corresponding pieces of metadata. For example, um, when someone is active on a social media network or where in the world they tend to be when they use their devices to sign into their profile. Um, and also, crucially, uh, there is engagement information that comes along with someone's social media identity that you get almost for free. Um, and that engagement can be extremely useful, uh, seeing who someone is talking to, who they follow, what they're talking about can be really useful for deciding who to target, uh, for doing research for future campaigns, uh, and also doing um, analysis of past campaigns that you've run. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's another feature of, data, of social data enrichment, which is transparency of networks that is kind of built in and, and almost comes for free. Um, uh, it's, it's extremely useful to be able to say, this person on Twitter is someone that we're interested in. Perhaps we know where they live and therefore what precincts they're able to vote in. Um, and now we can also see who all they follow. Um, and first of all, we might have some guarantees about ideological alignment of people that they follow or people that follow them. Uh, but then more than that, we can leverage that, that network uh, to take concrete bits of action. Um, uh, there's, there's an organization uh, that's based in Austin uh, and which uh, another speaker who's speaking later today, Steve Blackman, is heavily involved in called Blue Squad that did something really cool along these lines uh, during the lead up to 2020, which was saying, you know, come register with our application, give us access to your Twitter follower graph. We'll take the people that follow you, especially people that live in your area, um, go see if they're registered and then show you all of your friends who are not registered to vote um, so that you can reach out to them, encourage them to get registered, uh, tell them how they can get registered, tell them where their nearest polling place is, et cetera. Um, so the, the network that's built into social data makes things like that uh, possible. Uh, and then finally, as I've already mentioned, uh, there's just the potential scale of follow-up research and analysis. Um, if you're trying to do a retrospective of a mailing campaign, uh, maybe you have to call everyone that you mailed or send another mailer. Uh, but if you're doing a retrospective of a social media campaign, uh, you can get access to uh, the various activity data of the people that you tried to reach uh, and do large scale analysis that is not bottlenecked by uh, the manual work of trying to contact people that you that you have tried to reach out to. OK, um, so what we've talked about so far are the broad challenges of the problem. Um, what we see as a potential solution, uh, and then some particular motivations for that solution. Uh, there are some challenges that we recognize going into building the system. Uh, the first group of challenges that I'll talk about is something that I would characterize as challenges with data governance. Uh, first of all, the overall quality and coverage of data that's available, uh, especially in the progressive data ecosystem, varies widely, and it can vary along any different number of axes. Um, Maybe data sources in certain states are better than data sources in certain other states. Um, maybe data sources that describe a certain kind of person are more reliable than data sources that describe certain other kinds of people. Um, and so trying to build a system that is able to process large amounts of data and make inferences about that data is tricky when you can't necessarily trust the quality of that data. Um, another data governance challenge is that these particular data sources are idiosyncratic in uh, specific ways that are very difficult to predict uh, or that are difficult to respond to without uh, really in-depth knowledge of the domain. Um, a good example of this is that uh, different states in the United States uh, issue their own voter files of uh, who they believe is registered to vote in that state. Um, and each of those states will deal with different data challenges in totally different ways. Uh, for example, if they know the year that someone was born in, but not the particular day, Maybe they'll write that year down in a dedicated birth year column. That would be great. Maybe they'll write it down in a column that's supposed to be date of birth, but seems to be missing 
year or month information, uh, or uh, most insidious of all, maybe they'll just write down that they were born on January 1st of that year. Um, so first of all, not knowing how a particular source is going to handle that kind of discrepancy uh, makes handling it in an automatic way difficult. And then even if you know how they're going to handle it, um, it makes uh, knowing which bits of information to trust, especially when doing something as complicated as entity resolution, uh, much more difficult. Um, another data governance issue is uh, there's this really crucial balance to strike between the utility of caching third-party data. Um, it's, it's really nice to be able to make a call to an API that costs a certain amount of money per call uh, and then cache those responses and, and amortize the cost that you paid for that data over many different applications of the data. Um, however, as I've been mentioning, one of the big benefits of social media data enrichment in the first place is that there is built-in freshness and resilience and reliability. So uh, we need to strike the balance between um, having the utility of caching that data and also not trading off too much with uh, some of the built-in advantages of social media data enrichment. Uh, and then finally, there are all sorts of licensing agreements, usage requirements that we have to adhere to uh, based on this, this large constellation of potential data sources. Uh, in addition to those data governance problems, there are also data engineering problems and system architecture problems. Um, so first, one of the biggest ones is that if we imagine uh, this network of data sources that we want to connect to, some of them are social media data providers because we want to know about social media identities in particular. Some of them are third party or commercial data providers that we want to ask questions about and get information back from. Um, whatever those are, we have to build, test, and maintain integrations with that whole variety of third party, commercial, proprietary, and public data sources, uh, which is uh, no mean feat. Um, uh, even if we can do that, even if we can get data all into the same place, looking about the same, um, we need a framework for doing entity resolution that is cognizant of the particular challenges of doing entity resolution in this kind of space. And, and specifically what I mean by that is that it needs to be able to do more than just look at a set of disparate records and unify them based on some shared qualities. Uh, that's certainly a start, but knowing that a set of, that a set of records belong together um, is, is not sufficient on its own. We also have to be able to say those records belong together and also describe this particular person in the world uh, because most of the uses of this data boil down to there's a person, they live somewhere, we want them to vote, um, in a certain election, so how do we make that happen? Um, and so it's it's really essential to have a framework that's capable of, of tying records that we know belong together to a particular entity in the world. Uh, and then finally, there's an engineering desire to uh, preserve the inspectability of intermediate states of the system. Uh, we wanna be able to materialize uh, the results that the system produces and also the reasoning of the system as it's produced those results um, in a way that enables uh, debugging uh, and also research and analysis of uh, the various data sources that we're interacting with um, and the heuristics and business logic that the system is employing. Okay, um, so with those challenges in mind, now I would like to take a very brief detour um, and talk a little bit about what Apache Streams is and how it can be useful in solving some of these problems. So Apache Streams is all about uh, uh, digital, social, online data. It's about taking digital profiles and the activities around them uh, and uniting them into common vocabularies. Uh, really, it's about providing a common currency for systems that deal in online data. Uh, practically, what that means is that Streams uh, uh, maintains and publishes a suite of JRE-based modules and classes that developers can use, that your application can depend on, uh, for out-of-the-box integration with all kinds of different data providers, uh, including social media data sources like Twitter or Instagram, uh, and, and also commercial data providers like, like the ones that I've been mentioning in, in this talk so far. Um, really, the goal of Streams is to provide uniform interfaces uh, that let developers and engineers uh, abstract away the boilerplate integrations uh, and focus on solving interesting problems in novel ways rather than on uh, building plumbing for their system. Um, Streams is really about modeling data. Um, it fits very naturally into some of the um, uh, graph computational models that are used by other processing frameworks that we, that we all know and love. 
Um, but streams doesn't really have opinions about how you should be doing computation on your data. Uh, it fits very neatly into those other computational models, but really our goal is to um, uh, intelligently and accurately describe and model the data that these sorts of systems are trying to deal in. Okay, um, so the next thing that I wanna talk about is uh, from a very high level, uh, what the, the high level tool stack of the system is uh, uh, and how each of these components works to contribute to the goals that, that I've described so far. Um, so uh, first I wanna briefly describe uh, what some of the inputs to the system are. Um, so you'll see on the left and right sides of this diagram, uh, first by commercial person databases, uh, what I mean are networks of resources that provide uh, person level demographic data uh, that's obtained from a variety of upstream sources. Um, often that tends to be uh, credit bureaus, uh, but it can really be anywhere, uh, any kinds of public, semi-public or private data sources that these uh, commercial person data providers can get their hands on uh, and that they then uh, build systems around and resell. Uh, and then on the right side of the diagram, what I mean by state, first party or commercial voter databases are networks of data sources that provide uh, voter level demographic um, behavioral, like what election someone has voted in, uh, when they voted, where they voted, et cetera, uh, and also predicted or modeled data on the voter level about uh, particular voters obtained from, again, a variety of data sources. So those are the inputs to the system. Uh, the sort of central box in that diagram is kind of the engine that drives the system that I've been describing. Um, so the goal of that system is to mediate between these two uh, qualitatively very different kinds of data sources. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the role that each of the components that you see there plays in the system that we built. Uh, so as you might be able to guess, uh, Apache Streams is all about solving um, one of those first engineering problems that I mentioned a couple of slides ago. Uh, it provides mechanisms and vocabulary for integrating with these different data sources um, and also crucially for internal representation of the results of data enrichment. Uh, rather than having to build our own schema for how to model different features of social media data and also how to model enrichments on that data, uh, Apache Streams out of the box has um, uh, consistent and vetted models for how to model those things. Um, Apache Spark is the processing framework that we used. Uh, it provides portability and scalability of data processing and transformations, and also crucially, inspectability of various intermediate states. Uh, and finally, uh, Postgres as, as our open source relational database of choice uh, provides persistence of um, the responses that we've generated so far, and also resources that we've obtained from other data sources uh, provides indexing of both of those things uh, uh, and acts as the cache of things that we've done so far and information that we've learned. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what operating the system looks like. So in general, operation of the system involves supplying data from any number of supported data sources. Uh, Streams knows how to talk to those data sources, get data out of them, ingest that data, normalize it, and convert it into standardized objects and structures. Um, we then have transformations, uh, Spark jobs that are written in Apache Spark that know how to uh, extract relevant bits of detail uh, from those pieces of data, um, request or reuse uh, facts or enrichments either from the cache of things that we've already learned um, or from various uh, commercial or other data providers. Uh, and then crucially, uh, Spark is the thing that knows how to layer uh, incoming data onto the enrichments that we already know about uh, and, and build up uh, this central repository of information that describes voters and persons and the relationships between them. Uh, something else that the system is capable of doing is uh, when given some ground truth data, uh, uh, the integrations that Apache Streams provides uh, and, and the common currency that it provides uh, makes it really easy to characterize uh, the accuracy, the usability, and the efficacy of responses from different data providers. Uh, makes it very easy to compare uh, what a certain provider says against what we know to be the ground truth. Uh, additionally, uh, if there are new data sources that we want to integrate with, um, adding support uh, for those integrations is just a matter of uh, writing a new, uh, what we call a provider module in streams. 
um, which is very easy to do. Uh, there are lots of examples of how to do that in the streams project already. Um, and several existing streams providers uh, actually originated as modules that we built for this project because there were uh, voter data sources uh, or certain commercial data sources that we hadn't explored before that we thought would be useful to have uh, connectivity to. And so now those modules, in addition to being things that were really useful in this project, are, are available in the, in the Apache Streams project and can be used by anyone for whatever applications they want to build. All right, um, so the system that we built certainly had some, some shortcomings. Um, one of the biggest ones is that uh, starting from the ground up is very expensive. Uh, I call this priming the pump. Uh, for an initial batch of incoming data, it's very difficult to say, you know, uh, I've got these social media handles uh, or I've got these voter file records. I'd like to know more about them. Uh, if we don't have any data to start with, really the only thing to do there is to go uh, run that data through uh, a network of other data enrichment providers, uh, which becomes very expensive very quickly. So uh, once, once we have kind of a base layer of data that we can use, uh, it becomes a lot more economical. Uh, but startup costs are, are definitely high. Uh, and then another big problem is that uh, one of the things that this system is invested in doing is, uh, as I said, estimating the efficacy of different data sources. But first of all, uh, that's difficult to do with a limited amount of um, uh, enrichments that we've done in the first place. Uh, perhaps the data that we asked for from a certain provider uh, just didn't hit the kinds of data that they're particularly good at providing um, uh, or was not representative of the quality of their data for some other reason. Uh, on the flip side, um, maybe we know things about, um, uh, about how good a certain data source is, uh, but the data that we're trying to enrich is a relatively small amount of data. Uh, and so the things that we knew it to be true in the aggregate don't bear out for the hundred records that some client is interested in knowing more about. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, the system that we built is a prototype. Uh, and so there are some very clear development next steps for building that out. Uh, first, uh, the initial effort was as much a proof of concept as it was a, a tool for research and analysis. Uh, if we were to use this kind of tool at scale, it would require uh, much more large scale investigation of other kinds of data sources. Um, and that would require integrations with those data sources and experiments to figure out the efficacy of the data that those sources provide. Uh, and finally, uh, the next step that makes me the most excited uh, and really the, the ultimate vision for this kind of system is that if we have enough information about uh, what different data sources are good at providing, um, and if the cache that we've built is rich enough, uh, then uh, taking a certain piece of input data uh, and knowing what kinds of output data we want to obtain uh, can be thought of as as a, a graph optimization problem where the nodes are different data sources, uh, the costs are some combination of the likelihood of getting a positive match from that source and the cost for consulting that source. Uh, and so to get from one node to another uh, is really just a question of finding the shortest path through that graph, um, which is a really neat optimization problem um, that I think uh, ultimately this, is, this sort of system is, is very well uh, designed to be able to address. Um, okay, Claude, I, I did see your warning. I do want to wrap up your questions here in just a second. Uh, before I do that, I briefly want to plug a couple of things. Uh, first, I want to say that Apache Streams is always looking for more developers interested in building uh, data modeling components or in working on uh, social data pipelines in the first place. Uh, if you think Streams would be useful uh, for your project or are just interested in contributing in some way, uh, please feel free to get in touch. Uh, I'm at Brian Hodge on the ASF Slack. Uh, and I'm at B underscore Hodge on Twitter. Uh, and finally, I want to plug that Civitech is uh, actively hiring skilled data professionals uh, that are passionate about using their skills to further progressive causes. Uh, if that sounds like you, if you're interested in solving um, interesting, hard, challenging engineering problems at nationwide scale, uh, please, please reach out. Um, you can find job listings on, on our website, but you're also more than welcome to reach out to me directly at brian at civitech.io. All right, so I apologize. There's only a couple of minutes left. Um, if there are questions, I'm happy to take them now. Uh, I'm looking in the Q&A uh, section of the chat and not seeing anything. Uh, I'll certainly stick around for the next couple of minutes if, if people do have questions.
Uh, Claude, I, I'm not able to hear you. I'm not sure if other people are. Thank you, James. Um, yes, Steve, that's that's a great question. Um, so uh, a part of uh, the efforts that we undertook in building the system was trying to characterize uh, like which kind of commercial data providers uh, were most useful in describing um, uh, voters and, and in joining voter information to social information. Um, uh, there's an organization, uh, a data provider called People Data Labs that had very high match rates um, uh, I think there's another organization called uh, PIPL or PIPL, P-I-P-L, uh, that had really high match rates uh, and really high levels of, of success and really low numbers of false positives. Um, there are also, as, as I've kind of alluded to during this, during this um, talk, there are all sorts of data providers whose whole niche is just providing data about voters in the first place, uh, especially in the progressive data ecosystem. Um, and they have all kinds of enrichments that they can provide, um, model data, behavioral data, demographic data, et cetera. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, kind of a, a big blind spot that we identified is that um, uh, basically none of them provide uh, this kind of social identity data enrichment. Um, I should also briefly plug that uh, Steve, who I mentioned earlier, who asked that question in the chat, um, is, is giving another talk later today uh, that I think will also feature Apache streams. Uh, so I will definitely be attending that and I uh, encourage all of you to as well. All right. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, Steve. Yeah, uh, that's also a great question. Um, uh, the particular, like I'd, I'd have to look back at the analysis that we did to know like the actual numbers associated with the, the match rates for each of those pieces of information. As I recall, um, emails tended to be a really high success rate, which I think made sense. Like people tend to change phone numbers and change addresses, but they don't really change emails very often. Um, uh, I think the, the real uh, like meat of solving that problem was really that uh, you need a, a preponderance of data to be able to make those kinds of determinations, um, especially pieces of data that might not be um, uh, sufficient on their own to say that these two are in fact the same person uh, can become useful if you have uh, kind of three pieces of, uh, of otherwise suboptimal data that, that all seem to line up for some records. Any other questions? Um, all right, I'm not seeing any. Um, so uh, finally, I, I just wanna thank everyone for coming. Uh, like I said, this is the first time that I've had a chance to give this talk. Um, so I hope that you all found it useful. Uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful that I can give it again. Um, I've had an enjoyable Apache Con so far. I hope all of you have as well. Um, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about uh, this talk. Uh, or about Apache Streams or Civitech. Um, otherwise, thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>